And that is something that perhaps we, we talk about a lot. Uh, you might be thinking, well, there goes the preacher again. He's just talking, harping on us about sin. But when you think about it, it's probably the single biggest problem that we have in our lives. The, the idea that uh, our human nature uh, leads us to uh, do things according to our own will rather than seeking after the Lord's will. It takes some learning. It takes some discipline for us to think with the mind of Christ. We've talked often about that mind of Christ and how you get it from looking into the scriptures, growing stronger in our knowledge of the scriptures. So I think it's really needed for us to come to understand you know, how we interact with such a thing in this world, with sin. Because Christ saw fit to warn us in his word about about sin. In, in the inspired words in Acts chapter 20, uh, starting at verse 30, it says, Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch, and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The word is able to build us up and make us strong and help us to understand what sin is. You know, one of the one of the most uh, eye-opening situations that I've had uh, I can think of and really driving this point home that we have to be able to to recognize things that are not good in our lives. Sometimes we have to, we have to uh, step outside uh, of, of our comfort zone and look at those things around us so that we might recognize them. And back, as many of you know, in a, in a former uh, part of my life, I uh, taught driver training. And, and as a driving school owner, we had to go to uh, continuing education from time to time. And, and sort of ran out of things to go get trained in after a while and one of the things that I uh, narrowed in on one time was uh, drug uh, what was it called wrecking it was basically a class on how to recognize someone who is under the influence of alcohol and or drugs and I learned so much in in that class in that long day of of, uh, learning about the, the the signs and the symptoms of someone being under the influence of something. And uh, I I think about that often. You know, you see people walking down the street and try to piece together, okay, so what are they, what are they, uh, what are they under the influence of? Well, in the same way, sort of, as we, as we, uh, as Christians, as we familiarize ourselves with the word of God, we are then able to recognize, okay, that's not part of the will of the Lord. That's something that is contrary to what we find in the scriptures. And when someone tells you something that is a lie, you can recognize it. And when you're operating on your own will in life, you can recognize what sin is. And so we have to be careful of that relationship we have with sin. Because there, there may be those times in our life where we recognize that, yes, I know this is something that is sinful. But sometimes we don't push it far enough away. Sometimes we allow it to, you know, we might not let it all the way in the house, but we'll let it onto the front porch. And we'll let it, we'll let it sit there and we'll go out and visit with it from time to time. Sometimes that's the way we act when it comes to sin in our lives. And and maybe, and I'm hoping that in, in most cases, this is something that is done unwittingly, not something that we do on purpose but when we stop and think about sin in our life do we do we let it have a foothold do we let it have a place in our life you know we we have uh, uh, most human beings I think have a love hate relationship 
with sin. And, and that's that, letting it have that place on your doorstep. But a Christian should have a hate relationship with sin. It should be something that, that we despise, something that we don't want any part of, something that we can't stand to see sitting on our doorstep, something that we certainly can't stand to see within the threshold of our hearts. You know, we have to have that hate relationship. Matthew 6, 24 reminds us that we can't serve two masters. You know, we will, we will love the one and hate the other. We just can't, we can't help but do that. That's just the way that it is. You know, if you try to walk the line, if you try to, try to uh, kind of keep one foot on one side of the line and one foot on the other, eventually, eventually something's going to happen. And I think you can see this when you look into your life and you, you realize uh, the, the times in your life when maybe you've done this and you were, in tr you were trying to straddle that line. And sooner or later, it became easier to be one way or the other. Uh, it, perhaps if you put your nose into the scripture and you did things as the Lord desires and you came together with the saints and you were built up by the like precious faith, maybe that allowed you to have a disdain for that other side of the line and you step back over and hopefully are, are walking in alignment with the Lord's will. But other times when you allow yourself to be in the world and be part of it, it becomes comfortable. You, you come to recognize the, the music and the sounds and the, and the, the tastes and the things that, that, uh, that can draw us away. You know, one of the things that the biggest things that I find myself having to catch myself with is music. And, uh, you know, as a as a teenager uh, growing up without growing up without uh, uh, guidance in that direction, or at least uh, growing up not as a Christian, uh, I, I listened to some music in my past that I really enjoyed. And when it comes on the radio now, I still enjoy the music but when I when I start to now as an older hopefully wiser person listen to the words I realize oh well maybe maybe not <laughs> maybe maybe that shouldn't be part of my life but it's it's difficult because the music has a power over us uh there there's something there uh all of us have probably been in a situation where a song came on the radio and it took us back to where we were the first time we heard it. That song takes you back to the sights and the smells even of, you know, maybe where you were when you heard that song. Uh, having listened to many of these songs, having worked as a security bouncer in a, in a, uh, in, in a concert venue, uh, brings back a lot of interesting memories for me when I hear when I hear some songs. And that's something we have to battle with uh, and not let have a foothold in our lives. And it's, it's difficult. I, I'm, I'm here to tell you I understand that. I'm not standing up here telling you I don't have any struggle with those things. I think we're all like, like that in some degree, you know, that we have those struggles, whatever it may be. But we can't allow ourselves to have that comfortable relationship with sin. You know, we have to be wise when we're dealing with sin. And where better to go to, to look at wisdom than a book of wisdom from the scriptures? If you look at uh, Ecclesiastes 7, starting at verse 15, we'll read five verses here. I realize it's a bit lengthy, but I think, it, I think it's necessary to have the context here. But starting in verse 15, I have seen everything in my days of vanity. There is a just man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs life in his wickedness. Do not be overly righteous nor overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Do not be overly wicked nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you grasp this, and also not and also not remove your hand from the other. For he who fears God will escape them all. 
Wisdom strengthens the wise more than ten rulers of the city. For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. So it's a reminder to us that we're going to fall short. It's a reminder to us that we, that we uh, as human beings, are just not capable of living that perfect, sinless life. Not on our own. And in fact, what we need is someone to take that sin away from us. To, to be that proper sacrifice for sin. And we have that in Christ. We have that in Christ, and, and, and we'll, get to that. we'll get to that point later on in the lesson. But uh, we have to realize that just as that passage closes out in verse 20, for there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. You know, we all fall short of the glory of God. It's something that we have to accept and we have to keep sin in its proper place. And we have to keep our mind in the right place when it comes to it. And we have to have that desire not to allow ourselves to get dragged into it. Now, of course, there are times when we'll falter, when we'll stumble. But we can't let sin change us. And that's exactly what it does. When we allow sin to be in our lives, when we get a little too comfortable with it, when we cozy up to it, then it does change us. It makes us act in a different way. It makes us a different person in many cases as we, uh, as we go through life. Uh, Romans chapter 6 at verse 24. I want to read that for just a... It's not... Ma it's not uh, uh, I'm in the wrong place. Romans 1. 21. Romans 1 at verse 21 is where I want to begin. Romans 1 starting at verse 21 says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use of what is against nature. Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of, error, of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. You know, th there's a lot in this passage of Scripture that we can, that we can look at. And, and some of those things that we read through there just a moment ago, kind of ring with a familiarity to what we see going on in society today. It was going on then, and it continues to go on now. And uh, we need to be careful because we realize that those things are sinful that are spoken of in this passage. And we have to call it just that. We can't cozy ourselves up to the idea and say, well, it's, it's okay. I know, that, I know that that person over there involves themselves in those activities. But, you know, I, I, I can be comfortable with them. Uh, now, now, this is not to say that we need to be angry and mean and hateful and spiteful with them. But we have to call sin what it is. Because sin changes people. It has a, a way of getting into our hearts. And just in verse 28 there, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. You know, there's a place, there's a, a line that we cross that when we become too comfortable with something, it changes our mind. It changes the way that we 
that we interact with the world and certainly changes the way we interact with God. In fact, it separates us from God. Sin is a dangerous thing. It darkens hearts. It, it, speaking of that debased mind, you know, it, 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 it's a darkening of the heart. It brings a futility of mind. You know, if you go, go back over to Ephesians and um, go to Ephesians chapter 4 and at verse 17, uh, we'll, begin, we'll begin reading Ephesians chapter 4. At verse 17 says this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind having their understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not, you, you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. We have to put off that former conduct as it goes on in verse, in verse 22. There's that futility of mind, and as it says, being past feeling. We can become past feeling when, it, when dealing with, with sin. It doesn't bother us anymore. We can allow that to have a foothold in our life and we can even uh, cozy up to those that are dealing with or, or, or fully immersed in, in certain sins. And we can be comfortable with them. That puts us in a precarious place. It puts us in a place where uh, we can very easily have our mind start to be darkened in that direction. And, and stop, cease to see it as God does, as something that is abominable. You know, we, we don't want that futility of mind. We don't want that, uh, our senses to be dulled. You know, I, I think of, when I was reading through this and thinking about it, I can think of uh, someone who works with, uh, for instance, in a kitchen and they, and they are constantly dealing with hot items coming out of the oven. And they, their, their hands form a callus, if you will. They get strengthened and they're able to then touch hot plates much hotter than someone who doesn't have that resistance build up, if you will, uh, to, to use a term. I, I think of my mother who, for whatever reason, she didn't work in a kitchen through her life, but but she could pick up a hotter pot on the stove than I could. She could pick it up and move it and it didn't bother her at all. And I would touch that thing and, and scream in pain. And uh, she was more desensitized to that because she'd had more experience with that in, in her life. And if we, in like manner, are more experienced with and allow certain sins to have a foothold in our life, we become desensitized to them. They don't bother us as much. Yet God would, would, would spew them out. He would have nothing to do with them. He would, he would call them an abomination. And it's something for us to really think about. These futile things. Things that have no good purpose. To, uh, when I think of a futility of mind as it speaks of there in Ephesians 4. Uh, I think of things that we allow ourselves to get involved in in this world. Now, I, I'm not telling you that it's uh, sinful to, to watch these things on television, but, but I think it's futile. I don't think there's a good reason to, but think of the gossip shows that are on daytime television. Think of the self-help shows that are on daytime television. And think of the soap operas and so on. You know... Uh, of what good do those things do? There are things that, uh, you know, certain things that will pop up on our internet feeds that can drag us down that YouTube hole, if you will. If you are on social media and you've ever clicked on a video, you've probably been there to where you click on one and then you end up watching ten. And that's 
in many in many cases a futile use of your time it doesn't help in your uh in your life very much at all we have to be sure that we don't become changed by sin that we don't have that relationship with sin that is spoken against in the scriptures it looks like my transitions aren't going to work here on this on this page so there you have the whole lesson right there in front of you uh, so we'll, we'll work through that uh, from top to bottom there uh, first of all sin should have no dwelling place in us and we've been talking about this point already uh, just a little bit let's go back over to Romans and uh, chapter 6 again in the first two verses what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? You know, just to further drive that point home, go over a couple pages to Romans chapter 7. And at verses 8 and 9 it says, But sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it, killed me. You know, when you think about it, the fact that there is a law, the fact that there is a law, you know, it convicts us. When we read through and we understand what the will of the Father is, that's when we come to understand the things that we should and should not do. You know, it is something that we should, be, we should be dead to sin because we desire to live a life that is pleasing in the Lord's sight. And that old man of sin was nailed to the cross. The old man of sin was crucified. You know, in, in Romans uh, 6... 6 and 7 we read knowing this that our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves of sin for he who has died has been freed from sin you know and and going to the point that i that i jumped ahead in uh sin is progressive it is like a disease you know, in second timothy let's go over to second timothy and uh, in verse chapter 3, chapter 3, uh, starting there at verse 13, it says, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through the faith which is in Christ Jesus. You know, this is, of course, Timothy having been taught from childhood. We've studied, we've studied a little bit about that, knowing that he had those in his life that, that helped him to know the truth early on. And there are some of us here in this room today that, that have had that same life to where someone took us early and helped us to understand the truth. And... We grow stronger over time in our faith, but again, also, if we, if we allow ourselves to be at home with sin, it's progressive. It's like a disease that continues to grow. It's like something that, that continues to have a bigger part in our heart every day. And as we read in Romans 7, verses 8 and 9 there, you know, the... Uh, the, the, by the very fact of having the law, uh, it, it allows us to understand what the will of the Lord is. And it, in, in effect, puts us in a place where it convicts us. Where, when we're without the law, before we know, before, before mankind knew that there was sin, before mankind stepped outside of the the, the guidance of the Lord and ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was no sin. But now that that knowledge is there, now that that 
law has come, it's our job to be those that are obedient to it. You know, it's uh, just as an honest heart can be cut by the word. You know, if, if you think of the Bereans in Acts 17, verse 11, you know, the Bereans were those that were willing to hear and to study and to look into the word to find out if these things were true. You know, an honest heart can be cut by the word. A, a heart that is not seeking the Lord, that is not seeking and looking into the word, can be dragged down by sin, can be, can be accustomed to those things that are sinful, and it no longer has the same sting in our lives. When you get away with something long enough, you know, it's one of my, one of my gripes with, with the way that, uh, th th that we handle uh, speeding tickets and so on in this in, in our legal system you know there there's uh there are people that drive exceedingly fast over the speed limit every day of their life and they could go five ten years without getting a ticket and so they become accustomed to it and it becomes okay and then every five or ten years or maybe every year they get a ticket and and then they have to pay some money and well oh well then it, then it is uh, just what their fee that they have to pay to drive as fast as they want. They become desensitized to the idea that it's against the law. And the same way, you know, we are here on this earth and we live our lives and nobody is striking us dead uh, every time we do something wrong. So we become desensitized to the danger of sin. You now sin progresses by a social means as well. You know, as we think about how we interact one with another, if we have a, a friend who is involved in a sinful activity, we can become dragged into it if we socialize with that sin. If we allow that person to have such a hold in our lives that they begin to change us rather than the, us helping to change them by the word. We must not be deceived. If we think of 1 Corinthians, let's go on over to 1 Corinthians uh, 15. 1 Corinthians 15 at verse 33. And we read there, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. In verse 34, Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Now, it, we must have the knowledge of truth in us. And we have to be careful about who we spend our time with and what we allow in our lives. Each and every one of us is in danger of those things. We have to each and every one be careful about who and what is in our life. But there's hope because sin is already defeated. Christ has made his people free. You know, if you go back over to the book of Romans in chapter 8, the first four verses says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You know, going back there to verse 3, looking at the, the fact that the law was incomplete. The law wasn't something that could that could help us because it relied on us for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh God did by sending his own son you know and that that goes back to what we were talking about just a little bit ago about about the law pointing out our error the law points out our error and it's incumbent upon us to follow it well Christ came and was that perfect sacrifice so that we didn't have that handwriting of requirements as it is spoken of in, in Hebrews. 
and that we could that we could be free through that obedience to him and his word christ is our mercy seat if you will if you go back to romans 4 romans 4 starting at verse 7 we read a quote that comes from the psalms blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. And then going back just to the previous verse, uh, to verse, or chapter 3, starting at verse 24, the previous chapter, starting at verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Now drawing your attention back there to the next page over in Romans 4 uh, at verse 7 and 8. You know, in verse 7 it, it says that the sins were covered. The sin, our sins are covered by Christ. And, and when you think about that, think about the ark of the covenant. I, I heard this recently in a lesson and it, and it struck me. I'd never really thought of it this way before. But in, in, in the old time, on the old time of the old law, you know, as uh, God's people carried with them the, the, uh, the ark and what was in the ark, think about what was in the ark. It was the law. And cry, or the, the Lord was sitting on the mercy seat instructing them on what they needed to do in order to be to be within his good graces to remain faithful and in that way the mercy seat was that divider between the law and man and today we have christ we have christ that and his blood that was shed that covers our sins and it separates us from our sins that we might be able to be white as snow in the sight of God that we might be able to take hold of that redemption and it's not because we've done this right and this right and this right and this right but because we've been obedient to his will because we have done what he's asked and not by any of our own doing are we being saved we're being saved by the grace of the lord through our obedience being buried with christ in baptism so today if you're sitting here and you are not in christ what are you going to do about that you have to simply ask yourself the question am i buried in christ now in Romans 6 points us in the direction of what it means to be buried in Christ. Romans 6 at verse 3 beginning says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, Certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For who has, be, for who has died has been free. He who has died has been freed from sin. It's important that we ask ourselves this very important question. Have we done that? Have we been buried with Christ? in baptism today you've had an opportunity to hear a little bit of the word and i hope you continue to look into it each and every day to find out if these things are so if you've come to the point where in your studies where you believe that jesus is the son of the living god and you're willing to repent and turn away from those sins if you're willing to understand that sin has a deadly place in your life and you're willing to turn away from that. And then be willing to confess Christ before men. And be baptized for the remission of sins. There again, accessing that blood of Christ. 
that covering that will allow you to be seen in a sinless state by God, then by all means, don't wait another day. If you are in Christ and you find that sin has been a stumbling block in your life and there's something that the brethren can be helpful uh, with, if we can uh, pray for you, if we, and that's what we're here for as a family. If we can uh, be a, of assistance in any way to you, then please let that be known. As we understand we have to be faithful until death to receive that crown of life. Whatever your need may be, please come forward as we stand and sing.